Okay, it looks like it's time to get started again. Um, thanks for uh, rejoining us. Uh, we have um, two really uh, interesting talks coming up in this segment of the virtual meeting. Uh, and we're going to start with um, our uh, colleague Ken Klingenstein from Internet2. Uh, Ken is well known to many of the folks here and has had a tremendous gift for identifying uh, issues around privacy, identity management, and security um, uh, over the years, and um, uh, is back with some really uh, challenging, I think, questions. Uh, Ken has um, told me he really would like this to be quite interactive, so feel free to um, raise hands, use chat, um, uh, whatever, um, as his presentation goes along or as at the end when he uh, calls for questions. And with that, welcome back, Ken, over to you. Thanks, Cliff. Um, yeah, my, my, uh, my goal would be not to finish my slides today. <laughs> uh, just to, to have it be that interactive. We'll see how it goes. So um, there's a, a number of issues on the landscape that are emerging and they all need uh, answers. And I guess my greatest confusion at this point is who's going to be uh, able to answer them. Uh, able in terms of knowledge, able in terms of where the um, people who could answer this sit in the ecosystem of trust and identity that's out there today. We have lots of players. Many of them will raise their hand and say, ah, we can fix that. Um, I'm not sure they're the right authorities to do so. Uh, I'd love for there to be high levels of engagement on this. So um, through the chat session or raising your hand, um, please interrupt me. Um, we're gonna uh, touch on the following uh, points. So we're gonna talk a little bit about trust, privacy and portals. Um, that's the most vexing aspect right now in um, the landscape that I see in the ecosystem. We'll then look at cross-site tracking. This is a very active area um, with um, um, Google, among others, um, really trying to um, improve the situation about minimizing cross-site tracking while preserving um, business models. Um, attribute release control, um, the federated environment is built upon um, uh, release of attributes from an identity provider to a service provider, and that will enable access control and other kinds of uh, capabilities. Um, uh, who's going to um, uh, be in, in charge of the release of that information. Basic identity itself, um, you know, it, it, it has traditionally um, been anchored by uh, um, governments um, increasingly in a decentralized environment. Um, there's new ways of creating identifiers and vouching for the validity of the association of that identifier with a, a particular subject. Um, so that's in question. Um, the legal and regulatory safeguards that are out there are frankly a mess, frankly a mess in the US. Um, we'll talk about what the mess is and then I have a blank slide for who's gonna fix that. And then I'd like to, if we have time, uh, cover some of the uh, things that I might've missed in this that I should be talking about the next time I do this uh, uh, presentation. Um, trust, privacy, and portals. So um, in the federated uh, ecosystem, middle things have emerged um, in the trust uh, uh, system. Um, and they profoundly alter the end-to-end -end trust model for federated identity. The model itself was that an identity provider would trust a service provider and vice versa. And now we have all of these portals and proxies out there um, that um, intervene in those transactions and um, what's their uh, role? 
Um, in particular, the research and education environment is um, ripe with proxies and portals. Um, they're done sometimes to um, translate authentication approaches from, let's say, federated to IP address. That's a common one from um, easy proxy um, to complex composite sites integrating disparate entities. Um, CI logon is a, a very important one in the science community. Um, NIH is in the process of building a portal for the National Institutes, plural, of health. Um, and that one in particular has raised a number of concerns because um, placing um, um, anonymous access sites like PubMed behind a portal which is oriented towards um, um, identity and um, strong identity has caused a lot of stir about um, how do I get to uh, PubMed with anonymity when the portal is asking for identity? Um, Elsevier has a uh, science direct out there as a kind of authentication point for a variety of services some of which um, support anonymous and pseudonymous access, some of which like Pure and Mandalay, one identity. Um, easy Proxy, despite its name, is, real, is, is, uh, or is really a, um, a, a gateway to a lot of stuff where you have to provide identity and then um, those resources behind there might well not want to know that identity. Um, how do we do that? Uh, the browser itself is becoming a middle thing. I'll, I'll come back and talk about the browser specifically in terms of cross-site tracking, but the browser has become essentially the operating system for the web. And so <clears throat> we're seeing a move of functionality from um, external places into the browser. Um, and that becomes very consequential um, for who are the power brokers. And this complicates privacy and security. The middle thing can sit there, see the stuff that's going by and um, modify it. Um, um, and so um, how do we protect um, our lives and our privacy with in the presence of middle things? And most conspicuously, we don't even know where to start the conversation. There is no reference framework. There is no model out there that says, um, that defines the functionalities of pro proxies and portals, and perhaps um, uh, categorizes which functionalities um, affect privacy, which ones affect security, et cetera. Who's gonna answer this question? Who's gonna build the model? Well, um, middle things are to some degree a creature of multilateral federation. Um, in that bilateral world um, that um, industry would like to see, um, there really are very few middle things out there. Um, but in research and education, um, many, many services, many, many providers operate middle things. Again, CI logon, NIH. Um, and so, we might be the ones to answer it, but <clears throat> we're not. We're not even building that framework. Um, there's some trust standards organizations that could build this. Uh, Kantara is a standards organization that does levels of assurance and other kinds of standards. It's international. They have no framework. I just had a conversation a few weeks ago with NIST, and um, in a very different world, they have portals that they're trying to deal with. Um, and so uh, it, it's tempting to throw this question over to NIST. However, the lights are barely on in NIST. Um, um, a couple of years ago, uh, during the Trump administration, um, NIST got eviscerated. And they're just now re rebuilding the resources to work on this. Um, Typically, marketplaces often decide these questions, and I fear that the marketplace um, may decide this, and the marketplace seldom favors privacy. Cross-site tracking. 
Um, I suppose most of us have had that experience of doing a presentation and pulling up a website and there in the middle of the website, there were some ads that indicated that last week you were looking at something perhaps less appropriate than what you'd like to share with everybody else and cross-site tracking has um, uh, followed you around and said, oh, well, this person was interested in um, gazebos last week. We'll put up a bunch of gazebo ads in the middle of this website. And uh, <clears throat> that's awkward. That has um, actually raised a number of sensitivities and we can uh, look at uh, how to ameliorate that. Um, Cross-site tracking, unfortunately, has a variety of techniques that are used. Um, Third-party cookies are the most uh, obvious ones, but there's link decoration and bounce tracking. And what's awkward about this is that fine and upstanding services, at least in my mind, like federated identity, winds up using link decoration to convey information about your IDP to the SP and vice versa. And so some of these techniques were actually invented in the r and &E space, but were abused in the marketplace. And that perhaps happens frequently, where we invent stuff for the most noble of reasons without understanding that, oh my God, the marketplace and advertisers will um, work on that. Because some of this cross-site tracking is about to be addressed via a number of initiatives, there are new companies now springing up that are doing analytics and using a lot of artificial intelligence to begin to um, um, find ways around whatever solutions we're about to invent. So who will answer this? Well, browser manufacturers, since this cross-site tracking is happening largely via the browsers, uh, they're, they're offering to, to solve this, uh, Google in particular. If you're not familiar with the browser domain, there's very few independently coded browsers anymore. Firefox is one, I think Opera might be, but many of the others are built on a single code base called Chromium, which Google made open source and then built Chrome on top of. So to a large degree, I'd say almost 75% of the browser space is dominated by Chromium and its, its derivatives. And so Google feels like they're the right ones to address this since they um, have a, a web browser to do this. And Cliff has the independent browsers are a tiny market share. Indeed, they are. Um, so Google's offering to do this. And there's a working group um, that's been operational now for about six months. Um, Heather Flanagan, who many of you may know, is trying to facilitate it, that group. Uh, the issue there is that the third party cookie deprecation that Google is proposing to reduce cross-site tracking breaks many other things that are um, well-intentioned. And so the question is, how do we ameliorate the damage that Google will do in trying to minimize cross-site tracking? Who else what could answer it? Advertisers can answer it. Well, there's Google again. Third parties, um, the ones that are doing analytics. Um, governments could also, um, uh, begin to address some of the uh, cross-site tracking issues. But in the fractured environment in the US, that's not about to happen. In the EU, um, you've seen um, um, a number of initiatives by the uh, European Commission. Um, all of us have experienced the new cookie paradigm. When we go to websites in, that are based in Europe, we're given a choice of which cookies to accept. Um, I wonder about that capability within this space as well. Um, attribute release, boy, I've stepped into the middle of this. Um, so attribute release was again, a major uh, capability of the um, federated environment. We were supposed to have some consent modules developed. Um, some of us are still working on that. But to some degree, the authority for that 
attribute release is passed to uh, identity providers. I'll come back and, 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 and release uh, and talk about that in a second. Attributes are really important for access control, personalization and customization. Um, you want to release sufficient information to gain access to the content you'd like, but you want to release no more than that. So data minimization is an important feature for this. Um, metadata is the vehicle by which relying parties can indicate to um, either users or identity providers or to librarians what data might be needed. And um, one particular gnarly aspect of this is purpose of use. Users, identity providers might want to know if I'm releasing this attribute, how's it going to be used? What's going to happen when you're done with it? Um, the need for a normative taxonomy um, for the r and &E has percolated up for purpose of use. Um, you've seen it, as I indicated, in the um, cookie paradigm that the EU has promoted. Um, there's just four, three or four different purposes of use. Can we create something in the r and &E space that might talk about you're releasing information. Here's how we intended to use it in a classical taxonomy. And uh, here's how we intend to dispose of it at the end. Who's going to answer this? Well, boy, identity providers answer it today. Your, ide your federated identity provider typically says what attributes are going to be released about you. Um, that's not how we designed it, but that's how it's um, and that's how it's rolled out. Um, governments um, uh, can do this. Um, we designed this for users to be in control with some kind of um, consent module. Even the word consent is a tricky word in that the way it's used today, it's kind of like someone else has made a decision about what's going to be released. Can you consent to this? How about control? How about user control versus user consent? Wouldn't it be nice if we were in the um, driver's seat as users? When I mention this to librarians, a few of which are on this call, they say, well, you know, users may not know what will um, reduce the friction that they um, will encounter in getting to the content they want. So um, there's a group called fim for l If you're a librarian who's interested in federated identity, I urge you to do that. It's a part of Libra. Um, we just had our fim for l call this morning. Very good people on there, largely Europeans. We could use some US representatives. But there's been a perspective to date that librarians really know what should be released because um, users don't want to be bothered. I'd love some validation on that. Um, oh, I see it. Da, 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 da. That's an interesting. Da, 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 da. I'll have to come back and do that comment. Um, the decentralized identity paradigms. We'll talk in a second about how um, technologies have their um, inherent challenges. Um, relying parties may want to decide what attributes get released. Browser manufacturers. One of the things I saw recently was a Google mockup that had your browser presenting you with a list of options for which attributes could get released. That means the browser's watching things more closely than I'd like the browser to watch. Um, clearly, if you're doing encrypted transactions, we can avoid that, but most settings out there today are not around that. Uh, device manufacturers. Well, there's a Google again because of Android. My God, Google's all over the place on this one. Um, no surprise. Communities of interest. Um, this is a new idea. Communities of interest can certainly define taxonomies for purpose of use. And perhaps that's going to be an answer for this. Basic identity. This segues into the uh, comment that Pascal just uh, posted to the chat session um, about um, the distributed identities. So traditionally, identity was anchored via an identity provider using a government document and the level of assurance that 
us geeks in security talk about is anchored by what kind of documents do we use to prove you are who you are and then we'll associate that identifier, we'll create a level of assurance around that, all of the mumble jumble that we talk about. Um, there's pluses and minuses with taking an identity that's anchored with the government and um, um, decorating it with attributes from um, a lots of different sources, not necessarily from governments. Um, I'll just point out, watching the terrible situation in the Ukraine today, a lot of people don't have governments. And so what is going to be the source of the official documents that would anchor identity. This frets, frets me a great deal. Um, one of the solutions would be self-sovereign and decentralized identities. Sometimes these can be anchored to larger trust chains. A large, large amount of the time, it's anchored by a reputation system. I have 400 friends assert that I am who I am to the distributed identity provider and this binding of that identity to me is anchored by a group of cohorts of me. <clears throat> Pluses and minuses. I would mention that sometimes technologies um, have fatal flaws because of who's promoting the technology. I've been to a number of decentralized <clears throat> identity conferences. And what's tricky on this is that um, everybody has a different version of decentralized identity and they don't necessarily want to cooperate because it's decentralized and that's their nature. So these are individuals sometimes looking to make a market share, sometimes it's just their nature. I think the federated case that I've been a part of for 20 years had the virtue <clears throat> that we wanted to work with each other. We weren't trying to create an independent standard each in our own right. We wanted to federate and work together. So I'll mention the, that in terms of <clears throat> decentralized identities, a interesting concept, again, can tie to reputation systems, um, but um, is there something intrinsic about the people promoting this that could be a problem? Uh, so who will answer this? Well, governments have traditionally answered identify uh, uh, um, the basic identity, but again, governments are uh, sometimes fragile. Marketplace forces. Um, and then I'll just point out that <clears throat> we have a lot of new data these days that we don't want to look at, like surveillance. And so the idea of people talking in the open field is no longer open. On the other hand, that surveillance data could be a great anchor for some kind of trust based upon, well, we saw this, this person at that location. Um, and so we have an association that way. So that's a way of taking surveillance, which I think of is a great concern and perhaps tying it into creating some identity systems that we wouldn't have had in the past. <sighs> Legal and regulatory issues. So GDPR, enforcement is now finally taking place. Fines are being leveled. Um, 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 recitals are being developed by the Europeans that indicate the nuance that GDPR requires. It's a very sophisticated set of um, requirements. And I'm not quite sure that the marketplace is up to the nuance that's uh, embedded in GDPR. SHREMS 2 has added its own wrinkle in this um, and put the uh, US in a kind of an awkward position because um, our trustworthiness um, is no longer um, obvious. Um, we don't have the recourse that the EU would like to have. How do you begin to implement things like right to forget in our fractured environment? Um, the UK has its own version once they left um, via Brexit. Um, and it was actually the UK researchers who raised the concerns about PubMed being situated behind the um, NIH portal. Um, in the US, it's pure chaos. Most states are trying to develop privacy approaches, very different emphases, um, very different recourses, um, and um, many states uh, don't need no stinking privacy. Who will answer? Duh. 
somebody want to raise their hand at this point and tell me because uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not working. Um, it's very clearly not working, but I sure don't know. I don't see any, I, I don't see the federal government um, stepping up into this place with the polarization. Um, the state governments have um, um, different masters. Um, it's going to be tricky. Um, many transactions are interstate. What state would apply to that? Google. Yes, Google will answer it. Thank you, Oslin. Um, so let me just uh, close with this one um, um, and then hopefully invite some conversation. Um, a lot of this stuff, uh, a lot of security depend, a lot of privacy depends upon encryption. Um, encryption is reasonable at this point. Quantum computing will break most of the encryption algorithms that we have today. NIST and other places are hard at work at building um, encryption algorithms that might be resilient to quantum computing. Um, but um, we've got to be uh, careful that encryption, which underlies much of this stuff, is itself fragile. Um, and then reconciliation of national laws um, and now state laws um, and where the data will be geolocated. I'm seeing a lot of work by a lot of different organizations to make sure that their data is being stored in a place that's benevolent to whatever privacy views that organization may have. Lots of problems, no answers. I'll stop at this point. I'm, I'm appreciating the comments. Um, ooh, Joseph Glass. Uh, I don't know you, Joseph, but that's an interesting idea. So maybe you want to uh, 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 raise uh, internet too. Uh, huh. Thank you, Tara. I'll just mention that we, uh, we created part of this mess with the federated identity space. We intended it to be deeply privacy preserving. We had from the very beginning, the idea that there was gonna be a consent module out there that was going to enable users. Uh, that consent module has been slow to develop. There's been a belief, I'll, I'll say it in arrogance on the part of identity providers that users can't manage attribute release. So, uh, and part of this is because the error message that we have when you don't release the right attribute, attributes to get to a resource, our error message is the wonderful 404, resource not found. There's a few places out there that do the right thing and say, ah, we would have loved to give you this resource, but you didn't release these attributes. But for most relying parties, if you don't release the right attributes, you get a really opaque um, error message. We're working closely with Elsevier. And I, I've got to say that Elsevier, um, we're trying to develop a notion we call agile privacy. And maybe in the fall, um, uh, um, <clears throat> we can all um, at the next CNI in person, uh, we can talk about agile privacy and, and how well it works. But Elsevier gets it to a large degree about how depending upon what you release will give you anonymous services, pseudonymous services, which will give you a, um, the ability to keep your search histories, but without us knowing who you are, or will give you personalized service based upon who you are. So, um, so I would say, um, you know, we're, we're involved because um, uh, we create a part of the mess um, I have an NSTIC grant that we're still working on many years after NSTIC has passed um, called Scalable Privacy. And we have a, a wonderful consent module that came out of Duke University that we're trying to promote these very days to get it out there. Um, enough said. Uh, let's see, Cliffs uh, might enforce federal action. Anybody watching the congressional hearings for uh, the new uh, justice um, has got to be um, pessimistic about anything happening in that, in the at least the congressional sense. Um, uh, would the um, 
what federal agency would cover this, uh, FCC, Federal Trade Commission. It's not even clear what agency would do that. And many of the agencies are suddenly owned by uh, commercial sectors. So if it was going to be from the executive branch, Cliff, I'd worry which agency. If it's going to be from the congressional branch, um, I would wait for a long time. If it's going to be from the judicial branch, ooh, enough said. Appreciating questions. And on that happy note, <laughs> Oh, I think we're at time, and I know there are more questions that people would love to ask. Um, <clears throat> that Privacy Agile uh, work is very interesting, and I do hope we'll have an opportunity to hear more about that as, um, as it proceeds forward. Love to. We have, uh, we have some stunning demos, and, um, you know, it, it illustrates that um, even in the best intentions, publishers like Elsevier, they're wonderful. They, 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 they give you anonymous access and then they say, oh, but we need a place to hold your search histories. Give us your email address. We went, no, <laughs> how about something else? We have better identifiers. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pick that up. May we all get together in the fall. I'll leave it at that. Uh, we'll look forward to it. Ken, I know there are many more questions I'd like to ask. There are many more questions I know that our members here with us would like to ask. Um, we need to move on to the next presentation, but I hope you're able to stay around at least for a little while and maybe field a couple of questions in chat from people. Super. I thank you very much for yet another very provocative um, uh, presentation and uh, really appreciate you joining us today.